Book Two, Part One of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book Two, Part One. Number One. With the break of day, the generals met and were surprised that Cyrus should not have appeared himself or at any rate have sent some one to tell them what to do. Accordingly, they resolved to put what they had together, to get under arms, and to push forward until they effected junction with Cyrus. Just as they were on the point of starting, with the rising sun came Procles, the ruler of Teuthrania. He was a descendant of Demaratus, the Laconian, and with him also came Glus, the son of Tamos. These two told them, first, that Cyrus was dead, next that Arias had retreated with the rest of the barbarians to the halting-place whence they had started at dawn on the previous day, and wished to inform them that, if they were reminded to come, he would wait for this one day, but on the morrow he should return home again to Ionia, whence he came. When they heard these tidings, the generals were sorely distressed. So, too, were the rest of the Hellenes when they were informed of it. Then Clearchus spoke as follows. Would that Cyrus were yet alive! But since he is dead, take back this answer to Arias, that we, at any rate, have conquered the king, and, as you yourselves may see, there is not a man left in the field to meet us. Indeed, had you not arrived, we should ere this have begun our march upon the king. Now we can promise to Arias that, if he will join us here, we will place him on the king's throne. Surely to those who conquer, empire pertains." With these words he sent back the messengers, and with them he sent Carasophus the Laconian, and Menon the Thessalian. That was what Menon himself wished, being, as he was, a friend and intimate of Arias, and bound by mutual ties of hospitality. So these set off, and Clearchus waited for them. The soldiers furnished themselves with food and drink as best they might, falling back on the baggage animals, and cutting up oxen and asses, there was no lack of firewood. They need only step forward a few paces from the line where the battle was fought, and they would find arrows to hand in abundance, which the Hellenes had forced the deserters from the king to throw away. There were arrows and wicker shields also, and the huge wooden shields of the Egyptians. There were many targets also, and empty wagons left to be carried off. Here was a stall which they were not slow to make use of to cook their meat and serve their meals that day. It was now about full market hour when heralds from the king and Tissaphernes arrived. These were barbarians with one exception. This was a certain Phalanus, a Hellene who lived at the court of Tissaphernes, and was held in high esteem. He gave himself out to be a connoisseur of tactics and the art of fighting with heavy arms. These were the men who now came up, and having summoned the generals of the Hellenes, they delivered themselves of the following message. The great king, having won the victory and slain Cyrus, bids the Hellenes to surrender their arms, to betake themselves to the gates of the king's palace, and there obtain for themselves what terms they can. That was what the herald said, and the Hellenes listened with heavy hearts, but Clearchus spoke, and his words were few. Conquerors do not, as a rule, give up their arms. Then, turning to the others, he added, I leave it to you, my fellow generals, to make the best and noblest answer that ye may to these gentlemen. I will rejoin you presently. At the moment an official had summoned him to come and look at the entrails which had been taken out, for, as it chanced, he was engaged in sacrificing. As soon as he was gone, Cleonor, the Arcadian, by right of seniority, answered, They would sooner die than give up their arms. Then Proxenus the Theban said, for my part, I marvel if the king demands our arms as our master, or for the sake of friendship merely, as presents. If as our master, why need he ask for them, rather than come and take them? But if he would fain wheedle us out of them by fine speeches, he should tell us what the soldiers will receive in turn for such kindness. In answer to him, Phalanus said, The king claims to have conquered, because he has put Cyrus to death and who is there now to claim the kingdom as against himself? He further flatters himself that you also are in his power, 
since he holds you in the heart of his country, hemmed in by impassable rivers, and he can at any moment bring against you a multitude so vast that even if leave were given to rise and slay, you could not kill them. After him, Theopompus the Athenian spoke. Felonus, he said, at this instant, as you yourself can see, we have nothing left but our arms and our valour. If we keep the former, we imagine we can make use of the latter. But if we deliver up our arms, we shall presently be robbed of our lives. Do not suppose, then, that we are going to give up to you the only good things which we possess. We prefer to keep them, and by their help we will do battle with you for the good things which are yours. Phalanus laughed when he heard those words, and said, Spoken like a philosopher, my fine young man, and very pretty reasoning, too. Yet, let me tell you, your wits are somewhat scattered if you imagine that your valour will get the better of the king's power. There were one or two others, it was said, who, with a touch of weakness in their tone or argument, made answer. They had proved good and trusty friends to Cyrus, and the king might find them no less valuable. If he liked to be friends with them, he might turn them to any use that pleased his fancy, save for a campaign against Egypt. Their arms were at his service. They would help to lay that country at his feet. Just then Clearchus returned, and wished to know what answer they had given. The words were barely out of his mouth, before Phalanus, interrupting, answered, "'As for your friends here, one says one thing, and one another. Will you please give us your opinion?' And he replied, "'The sight of you, Phalanus, caused me much pleasure, and not only me, but all of us, I feel sure. For you are a Hellene, even as we are, every one of us whom you see before you. In our present plight we would like to take you into our counsel as to what we'd better do touching your proposals. I beg you then solemnly, in the sight of heaven, do you tender us such advice as you shall deem best and worthiest, and such as shall bring you honour of after-time, when it will be said of you how once on a time Phalanus was sent by the great king to bid certain Hellenes yield up their arms, and when they had taken him into their counsel he gave them such and such advice. You know that whatever advice you do give us cannot fail to be reported in Hellas. Clearchus threw out these leading remarks in hopes that this man, who was the ambassador from the king, might himself be led to advise them not to give up their arms, in which case the Hellenes would be still more sanguine and hopeful. But, contrary to his expectation, Phalanus turned round and said, I say that if you have one chance, one hope in ten thousand, to wage a war with the king successfully, do not give up your arms. That is my advice. If, however, you have no chance of escape without the king's consent, then, I say, save yourselves in the only way you can. And Clearchus answered, So then, that is your deliberate view? Well, this is our answer. Take it back. We conceive that in either case, whether we are expected to be friends with the king, we shall be worth more as friends if we keep our arms than if we yield them to another, or whether we are to go to war, we shall fight better with them than without. And Felinus said, That answer we will repeat, but the king bade me tell you this besides. Whilst you remain here there is truce, but one step forward or one step back, the truce ends there is war. Will you then please inform us as to that point also? Are you minded to stop and keep truce, or is there to be war? What answer shall I take from you? And Clearchus replied, Pray answer that we hold precisely the same views on this point as the king. How say you the same views? asked Phalanus. Clearchus made answer, As long as we stay here there is truce but a step forward or a step backward, the truce ends. There is war. The other again asked, Peace or war, what answer shall I make? Clearchus returned answer once again in the same words. Truce if we stop, but if we move forwards or backwards, war. But what he was minded really to do, that he refused to make further manifest. Number 2 Phalanus and those that were with him turned and went, but the messengers from Arias 
Proclus and Carisophus came back. As to Menon, he stayed behind with Arias. They brought back this answer from Arias. There are many Persians, he says, better than himself, who will not suffer him to sit upon the king's throne. But if you are minded to go back with him, you must join him this very night, otherwise he will set off himself to-morrow on the homeward route. And Clearchus said, It had best stand thus between us, then. If we come, well and good, be it as you propose. But if we do not come, do whatsoever you think most conducive to your interests. And so he kept these also in the dark as to his real intention. After this, when the sun was already sinking, he summoned the generals and officers, and made the following statement. Sirs, I sacrificed, and found the victims unfavourable to an advance against the king. After all, it is not so surprising, perhaps, for, as I now learn, between us and the king flows the river Tigris, navigable for big vessels, and we could not possibly cross it without boats, and boats we have none. On the other hand, to stop here is out of the question, for there is no possibility of getting provisions. However, the victims were quite agreeable to us joining the friends of Cyrus. This is what we must do, then. Let each go away and sup on whatever he has. At the first sound of the bugle to turn in, get kit and baggage together. At the second signal, place them on the baggage animals, and at the third, fall in and follow the lead, with the baggage animals on the inside protected by the river, and the troops outside. After hearing the orders, the generals and officers retired, and did as they were bid, and for the future Clearchus led, and the rest followed in obedience to his orders. Not that they had expressly chosen him, but they saw that he alone had the sense and wisdom requisite in a general, while the rest were inexperienced. Here, under cover of the darkness which descended, the Thracian Miltosythes, with forty horsemen and three hundred Thracian infantry, deserted to the king, but the rest of the troops, Clearchus leading and the rest following, in accordance with the orders promulgated, took their departure, and about midnight reached their first stage, having come up with Arias and his army. They grounded arms just as they stood in rank, and the generals and officers of the Hellenes met in the tent of Arias. There they exchanged oaths, the Hellenes on the one side and Arias with his principal officers on the other, not to betray one another, but to be true to each other as allies. The Asiatics further solemnly pledged themselves by oath to lead the way without treachery. The oaths were ratified by the sacrifice of a bull, a wolf, a boar, and a ram over a shield. The Hellenes dipped a sword, the barbarians a lance, into the blood of the victims. As soon as the pledge was taken, Clearchus spoke. "'And now, Arias,' he said, "'since you and we have one expedition in prospect, will you tell us what you think about the route? Shall we return the way we came, or have you devised a better?' He answered, "'To return the same way is to perish to a man by hunger.' for at this moment we have no provisions whatsoever. During the seventeen last stages, even on our way hither, we could extract nothing from the country, or, if there was now and again anything, we passed over and utterly consumed it. At this time our project is to take another and a longer journey, certainly, but we shall not be in straits for provisions. The earliest stages must be very long, as long as we can make them. The object is to put as large a space as possible between us and the royal army." Once we are two or three days' journey off, the danger is over. The king will never overtake us. With a small army he will not dare to dog our heels, and with a vast equipment he will lack the power to march quickly. Perhaps he, too, may even find a scarcity of provisions. There, said he, you asked for my opinion. See, I have given it. Here was a plan of the campaign which was equivalent to a stampede, Helter-skelter they were to run away, or get into hiding somehow. But fortune proved a better general. For, as soon as it was day, they recommenced the journey, keeping the sun on their right, and calculated that with the westering rays they would have reached villages in the territory of Babylonia, and in this hope they were not deceived. While it was yet afternoon, they thought they caught sight of some of the enemy's cavalry, and those of the Hellenes who were not in rank ran to their ranks and Arias, who was riding in a wagon to nurse a wound, got down and donned his cuirass, the rest of his party following his example. Whilst they were arming themselves, the scouts, who had been sent forward, 
came back with the information that they were not cavalry, but baggage animals grazing. It was at once clear to all that they must be somewhere in the neighbourhood of the king's encampment. Smoke could actually be seen rising, evidently from villages not far ahead. Clearchus hesitated to advance upon the enemy, knowing that the troops were tired and hungry, and indeed it was already late. On the other hand, he had no mind either to swerve from his route, guarding against any appearance of flight. Accordingly, he marched straight as an arrow, and with sunset entered the nearest villages with his vanguard and took up quarters. These villages had been thoroughly sacked and dismantled by the royal army, down to the very woodwork and furniture of the houses. Still, the vanguard contrived to take up their quarters in some sort of fashion, but the rear division, coming up in the dark, had to bivouac as best they could, one detachment after another, and a great noise they made, with hue and cry to one another, so that the enemy could hear them, and those in their immediate proximity actually took to their heels, left their quarters and decamped, as was plain enough next morning, when not a beast was to be seen, nor a sign of camp or wreath of smoke anywhere in the neighbourhood. The king, as it would appear, was himself quite taken aback by the advent of the army, as he fully showed by his proceedings next day. During the progress of this night the Hellenes had their turn of scare. A panic seized them, and there was a noise and clatter hardly to be explained except by the visitation of some sudden terror. But Clearchus had with him the Elean Tolmides, the best herald of his time. Him he ordered to proclaim silence, and then to give out this proclamation of the generals. Whoever will give any information as to who let an ass into the camp shall receive a talent of silver in reward. On hearing this proclamation, the soldiers made up their minds that their fear was baseless, and their generals safe and sound. At break of day, Clearchus gave the order to the Hellenes to get under arms in line of battle, and take up exactly the same position as they held on the day of the battle. End of Book Two, Part One Book Two, Part Two of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book Two, Part Two. Number Three. And now comes the proof of what I stated above that the king was utterly taken aback by the sudden apparition of the army. Only the day before he had sent and demanded the surrender of their arms, and now, with the rising sun, came heralds sent by him to arrange a truce. These, having reached the advanced guard, asked for the generals. The guard reported their arrival, and Clearchus, who was busy inspecting the ranks, sent back word to the heralds that they must wait his leisure. Having carefully arranged the troops so that from every side they might present the appearance of a compact battle line without a single unarmed man in sight, he summoned the ambassadors, and himself went forward to meet them, with the soldiers who, for choice accoutrement and noble aspect, were the flower of his force, a cause which he had invited the other generals also to adopt. And now, being face to face with the ambassadors, he questioned them as to what their wishes were. They replied that they had come to arrange a truce, and were persons competent to carry proposals from the king to the Hellenes, and from the Hellenes to the king. He returned answer to them, "'Take back word then to your master that we need a battle first, for we have had no breakfast, and he will be a brave man who will dare mention the word truce to Hellenes without providing them with breakfast.' With this message the heralds rode off, but were back again in no time, which was a proof that the king— or some one appointed by him to transact the business, was hard by. They reported that the message seemed reasonable to the king. They had now come bringing guides who, if a truce were arranged, would conduct them where they could get provisions. Clearchus inquired whether the truce was offered to the individual man merely as they went and came, or to all alike. To all, they replied, until the king receives your final answer. When they had so spoken, Clearchus, having removed the ambassadors, held a council, and it was resolved to make a truce at once, and then quietly to go and secure provisions. And Clearchus said, I agree to the resolution. Still, I do not propose to announce it at once, 
but to while away time till the ambassadors begin to fear that we have decided against the truce, though I suspect, he added, the same fear will be operative on the minds of our soldiers also. As soon as the right moment seemed to have arrived, he delivered his answer in favour of the truce, and bade the ambassadors at once conduct them to the provisions. So these led the way, and Clearchus, without relaxing precaution, in spite of having secured a truce, marched after them with his army in line, and himself in command of the rear-guard. Over and over again they encountered trenches and conduits so full of water that they could not be crossed without bridges, but they contrived well enough for these by means of trunks of palm-trees which had fallen, or which they cut down for the occasion. And here Clericus's system of superintendence was a study in itself. As he stood with a spear in his left hand and a stick in the other, and when it seemed to him there was any dawdling among the parties told off to the work, he would pick out the right man, and down would come the stick. Nor, at the same time, was he above plunging into the mud and lending a hand himself, so that every one else was forced for very shame to display equal alacrity. The man, told off for the business, were a man of thirty years of age, but even the elder men, when they saw the energy of Clearchus, could not resist lending their aid also. What stimulated the haste of Clearchus was the suspicion in his mind that these trenches were not, as a rule, so full of water, since it was not the season to irrigate the plain, and he fancied that the king had let the water on for the express purpose of vividly presenting to the Hellenes the many dangers with which their march was threatened at the very start. Proceeding on their way, they reached some villages, where their guides indicated to them that they would find provisions. They were found to contain plenty of corn and wine made from palm dates, and an acidulated beverage extracted by boiling from the same fruit. As to the palm nuts or dates themselves, it was noticeable that the sort which we are accustomed to see in Hellas were set aside for the domestic servants. Those put aside for the masters are picked specimens, and are simply marvellous for their beauty and size, looking like great golden lumps of amber. Some specimens they dried and preserved as sweetmeats. Sweet enough they were as an accompaniment of wine, but apt to give headache. Here, too, for the first time in their lives, the man tasted the brain of the palm. No one could help being struck by the beauty of this object, and the peculiarity of its delicious flavour. But this, like the dried fruits, was exceedingly apt to give headache. When this cabbage or brain has been removed from the palm, the whole tree withers from top to bottom. In these villages they remained three days, and a deputation from the great king arrived, Tissaphernes and the king's brother-in-law and three other Persians, with a retinue of many slaves. As soon as the generals of the Hellenes had presented themselves, Tissaphernes opened the proceedings with the following speech through the lips of an interpreter. Men of Hellas, I am your next-door neighbour in Hellas. Therefore was it that I, when I saw into what a sea of troubles you were fallen, regarded it as a godsend, if by any means I might obtain, as a boon from the king, the privilege of bringing you back in safety to your own country, and that, I take it, will earn me gratitude from you and all Hellas. In this determination I preferred my request to the king. I claimed it as a favour which was fairly my due for was it not I who first announced to him the hostile approach of Cyrus, who supported that announcement by the aid I brought, who alone among the officers confronted with the Hellenes in battle did not flee, but charged right through and united my troops with the king inside your camp, where he was arrived having slain Cyrus? It was I, lastly, who gave chase to the barbarians under Cyrus, with the help of those here present with me at this moment, which are also among the trustiest followers of our lord the king. Now I counsel you to give a moderate answer, so that it may be easier for me to carry out my design, if happily I may obtain from him some good thing on your behalf. Thereupon the Hellenes retired and took counsel. Then they answered, and Clearchus was their spokesman, We neither mustered as a body to make war against the king, nor was our march conducted with that object but it was Cyrus, as you know, who invented many and diverse pretexts that he might take you off your guard and transport us hither. 
Yet, after a while, when we saw that he was in sore straits, we were ashamed, in the sight of God and man, to betray him whom we had permitted for so long a season to benefit us. But now that Cyrus is dead, we set up no claim to his kingdom against the king himself. There is neither person nor thing for the sake of which we would care to injure the king's country. We would not choose to kill him if we could, rather we would march straight home if we were not molested. But, God helping us, we will retaliate on all who injure us. On the other hand, if any be found to benefit us, we do not mean to be outdone in kindly deeds as far as in us lies. So he spoke, and Tissaphernes listened and replied, That answer will I take back to the king, and bring you word from him again. Until I come again, let the truce continue, and we will furnish you with a market. All next day he did not come back, and the Hellenes were troubled with anxieties, but on the third day he arrived with the news that he had obtained from the king the boon he asked. He was permitted to save the Hellenes, though there were many gainsayers who argued that it was not seemly for the king to let those who had marched against him depart in peace. And at last he said, You may now, if you like, take pledges from us that we will make the countries through which you pass friendly to you, and will lead you back without treachery into Hellas, and will furnish you with a market, and wherever you cannot purchase we will permit you to take provisions from the district. You, on your side, must swear that you will march as through a friendly country, without damage, merely taking food and drink wherever we fail to supply a market, or, if we afford a market, you shall only obtain provisions by paying for them. This was agreed to, and oaths and pledges exchanged between them. Tisiphernes and the king's brother-in-law upon the one side, and the generals and officers of the Hellenes on the other. After this, Tisiphernes said, And now I go back to the king. As soon as I have transacted what I have a mind to, I will come back, ready equipped, to lead you away to Hellas, and to return myself to my own dominion. Number 4. After these things, the Hellenes and Arius waited for Tisiphernes, being encamped close to one another. For more than twenty days they waited during which time there came visitors to Arius, his brother and other kinsfolk. To those under him came certain other Persians, encouraging them and bearing pledges to some of them from the king himself, that he would bear no grudge against them on account of the part they bore in the expedition against him with Cyrus, or for aught else of the things which were past. Whilst these overtures were being made, Arius and his friends gave manifest signs of paying less attention to the Hellenes, so much so that, if for no other reason, the majority of the latter were not well pleased, and they came to Clericus and the other generals, asking what they were waiting for. "'Do we not know full well,' they said, "'that the king would give a great deal to destroy us, so that other Hellenes may take warning and think twice before they march against the king? Today it suits his purpose to induce us to stop here, because his army is scattered. But as soon as he has got together another armament, attack us most certainly he will.' How do we know he is not at this moment digging away at trenches, or running up walls, to make our path impassable? It is not to be supposed that he will desire us to return to Hellas with a tale how a handful of men like ourselves beat the king at his own gates, laughed him to scorn, and then came home again. Clearchus replied, I too am keenly aware of all this, but I reason thus. If we turn our backs now, they will say we mean war and are acting contrary to the truce, and then what follows? First of all, no one will furnish us with a market or means of providing ourselves with food. Next, we shall have no one to guide us. Moreover, such action on our part will be a signal to Arius to hold aloof from us, so that not a friend will be left to us. Even those who were formerly our friends will now be numbered with our enemies." What other river or rivers we may find we have to cross I do not know, but this we know, to cross the Euphrates in face of resistance is impossible. You see, in the event of being driven to an engagement, we have no cavalry to help us, but with the enemy it is the reverse, not only the most, but the best of his troops are cavalry, so that if we are victorious we shall kill no one, but if we are defeated not a man of us can escape. For my part, I cannot see why the king, who has so many advantages on his side, if he desires to destroy us, should swear oaths and tender solemn pledges merely in order to perjure himself in the sight of heaven, to render his word worthless 
and is credit discreditable the wide world over. These arguments he propounded at length. Meanwhile, Tissaphernes came back, apparently ready to return home. He had his own force with him, and so had Arontas, who was also present, his. The latter brought, moreover, his bride with him, the king's daughter, whom he had just wedded. The journey was now at length fairly commenced. Tissaphernes led the way, and provided a market. They advanced, and Arius advanced too, at the head of Cyrus's Asiatic troops, side by side with Tissaphernes and Orontas, and with these two he also pitched his camp. The Hellenes, holding them in suspicion, marched separately with the guides, and they encamped on each occasion a parasang apart, or rather less, and both parties kept watch upon each other as if they were enemies, which hardly tended to lull suspicion and sometimes, whilst foraging for wood and grass, and so forth, on the same ground, blows were exchanged, which occasioned further embitterments. Three stages they had accomplished ere they reached the wall of Media, as it is called, and passed within it. It was built of baked bricks, laid upon bitumen. It was twenty feet broad and a hundred feet high, and the length of it was said to be twenty parasangs. It lies at no great distance from Babylon." From this point they marched two stages, eight parasangs, and crossed two canals, the first by a regular bridge, the other spanned by a bridge of seven boats. These canals issued from the Tigris, and from them a whole system of minor trenches was cut, leading over the country, large ones to begin with, and then smaller and smaller, till at last they become the merest runnels, like those in Hellas used for watering millet fields. They reached the river Tigris. At this point there was a large and thickly populated city, named Sittas, at a distance of fifteen furlongs from the river. The Hellenes accordingly encamped by the side of that city, near a large and beautiful park, which was thick with all sorts of trees. The Asiatics had crossed the Tigris, but somehow were entirely hidden from view. After supper, Prosenus and Xenophon were walking in front of the Place d'Armes, when a man came up and demanded of the advanced guard where he could find Prosenus or Clearchus. He did not ask for Menon, and that too though he came from Arias, who was Menon's friend. As soon as Prosenus had said, I am he whom you seek, the man replied, I have been sent by Arias and Artaosus, who have been trusty friends to Cyrus in past days, and are your well-wishers. They warn you to be on your guard, in case the barbarians attack you in the night." There is a large body of troops in the neighbouring park. They also warn you to send and occupy the bridge over the Tigris, since Tissaphernes is minded to break it down in the night, if he can, so that you may not cross, but be caught between the river and the canal. On hearing this, they took the man to Clearchus, and acquainted him with his statement. Clearchus, on his side, was much disturbed, and indeed alarmed at the news. But a young fellow who was present, struck with an idea, suggested that the two statements were inconsistent, as to the contemplated attack and the proposed destruction of the bridge. Clearly, the attacking party must either conquer or be worsted. If they conquer, what need of their breaking down the bridge? Why, if there were half a dozen bridges, said he, we should not be any the more able to save ourselves by flight. There would be no place to flee to. But, in the opposite case, suppose we win, with the bridge broken down, it is they who will not be able to save themselves by flight, and, what is worse for them, not a single soul will be able to bring them succour from the other side, for all their numbers, since the bridge will be broken down. Clearchus listened to the reasoning, and then he asked the messenger, how large the country between the Tigris and the canal might be. A large district, he replied, and in it are villages and cities, numerous and large. Then it dawned upon them. The barbarians had sent the men with subtlety, in fear lest the Hellenes should cut the bridge and occupy the island territory, with the strong defences of the Tigris on the one side and of the canal on the other, supplying themselves with provisions from the country so included, large and rich as it was, with no lack of hands to till it, in addition to which a harbour of refuge and asylum would be found for any one who was minded to do the king a mischief. After this they retired to rest in peace, not, however, neglecting to send a guard to occupy the bridge in spite of all, and there was no attack from any quarter whatsoever, nor did any of the enemy's people approach the bridges, so the guards were able to report next morning. But as soon as it was morning they proceeded to cross the bridge, which consisted of thirty-seven vessels, 
and in so doing they used the utmost precaution possible. For reports were brought by some of the Hellenes with Tessifurnus that an attempt was to be made to attack them while crossing. All this turned out to be false, though it is true that while crossing they did catch sight of Glus watching, with some others, to see if they crossed the river. But as soon as he had satisfied himself on that point, he rode off and was gone. From the river Tigris they advanced four stages, twenty parasangs, to the river Fiscus, which is a hundred feet broad and spanned by a bridge. Here lay a large and populous city named Opis, close to which the Hellenes were encountered by the natural brother of Cyrus and Artaxerxes, who was leading a large army from Susa and Ecbatana to assist the king. He halted his troops and watched the Hellenes march past. Clericus led them in a column, two abreast, and from time to time the vanguard came to a standstill, just so often and just so long the effect repeated itself down to the hindmost man. Halt! 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 along the whole line, so that even to the Hellenes themselves their army seemed enormous, and the Persian was fairly astonished at the spectacle. From this place they marched through Media, six desert stages, thirty parasangs, to the villages of Parasatis, Cyrus's and the king's mother. These Tissaphernus, in mockery of Cyrus, delivered over to the Hellenes to plunder, except that the folk in them were not to be made slaves. They contained much corn, cattle, and other property. From this place they advanced four desert stages, twenty parasangs, keeping the Tigris on the left. On the first of these stages, on the other side of the river, lay a large city. It was a well-to-do place named Kaina, from which the natives used to carry across loaves and cheeses and wine on rafts made of skins. End of Book Two, Part Two Book Two, Part Three of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book Two, Part Three. Number Five. After this, they reached the river Zapatas, which is four hundred feet broad, and here they halted three days. During the interval, suspicions were rife, though no act of treachery displayed itself. Clericus accordingly resolved to bring to an end these feelings of mistrust before they led to war. Consequently, he sent a messenger to the Persian to say that he desired an interview with him, to which the other readily consented. As soon as they were met, Clearchus spoke as follows. "'To Sophernes, he said, "'I do not forget that oaths have been exchanged between us, and right hands shaken, in token that we will abstain from mutual injury. But I can see that you watch us narrowly as if we were foes, and we, seeing this, watch you narrowly in return.' But, as I fail to discover, after investigation, that you are endeavouring to do as a mischief, and I am quite sure that nothing of the sort has ever entered our heads with regard to you, the best plan seemed to me to come and talk the matter over with you, so that, if possible, we might dispel the mutual distrust on either side. For I have known people ere now, the victims in some cases of calumny, or possibly of mere suspicion, who, in apprehension of one another, and eager to deal the first blow, have committed irreparable wrong against those who neither intended nor so much as harboured a thought of mischief against them. I have come to you under a conviction that such misunderstandings may best be put a stop to by personal intercourse, and I wish to instruct you plainly that you are wrong in mistrusting us. The first and weightiest reason is that the oath which we took in the sight of heaven our barrier to mutual hostility. I envy not the man whose conscience tells him that he has disregarded these. For, in a war with heaven, by what swiftness of foot can a man escape? In what quarter find refuge? In what darkness slink away and be hid? To what strong fortress scale and be out of reach? Are not all things in all ways subject to the gods? Is not their lordship over all alike outspread? As touching the gods, therefore, and our oaths, that is how I view this matter. To their safekeeping we consign the friendship which we solemnly contracted. But, turning to matters human, you I look upon as our greatest blessing in this present time. 
with you every path is plain to us, every river passable, and of provisions we shall know no stint. But without you all our way is through darkness, for we know nothing concerning it, every river will be an obstacle, each multitude a terror. But, worst terror of all, the vast wilderness, so full of endless perplexity. Nay, if in a fit of madness we murdered you, what then? In slaying our benefactor, should we not have challenged to enter the lists against us a more formidable antagonist in the king himself? Let me tell you how many high hopes I should rob myself of were I to take in hand to do you mischief. I coveted the friendship of Cyrus. I believed him to be abler than any man of his day to benefit those whom he chose. But to-day I look, and behold, it is you who are in his place. The power which belonged to Cyrus and his territory are yours now. You have them, and your own satrapy besides, safe and sound, while the king's power, which was a thorn in the side of Cyrus, is your support. This being so, it would be madness not to wish to be your friend. But I will go further, and state to you the reasons of my confidence that you on your side will desire our friendship. I know that the Mysians are a cause of trouble to you, and I flatter myself that with my present force I could render them humbly obedient to you. This applies to the Pisidians also, and I am told there are many other such tribes besides. I think I can deal with them all. They shall cease from being a constant disturbance to your peace and prosperity. Then there are the Egyptians. I know your anger against them to-day is very great. Nor can I see what better force you will find to help you in chastising them than this which marches at my back to-day. Again, if you seek the friendship of any of your neighbours round, there shall be no friend so great as you. If any one annoys you, with us as your faithful servitors you shall be lorded over him. And such service we will render you, not as hirelings merely for pay's sake, but for the gratitude which we shall rightly feel to you, to whom we owe our lives. As I dwell on these matters, I confess, the idea of your feeling mistrust of us is so astonishing, that I would give much to discover the name of the man who is so clever of speech that he can persuade you that we harbour designs against you. Clearchus ended, and Tissaphernes responded thus. I am glad, Clearchus, to listen to your sensible remarks, for with the sentiments you hold, if you were to devise any mischief against me, it could only be out of malevolence to yourself. But if you imagine that you, on your side, have any better reason to mistrust the king and me, than we you, listen to me in turn, and I will undeceive you. I ask you, does it seem to you that we lack the means, if we had the will, to destroy you? Have we not horsemen enough, or infantry, or whatever other arm you like, whereby we may be able to injure you, without risk of suffering in return? Or possibly, do we seem to you to lack the physical surroundings suitable for attacking you? Do you not see all these great plains, which you would find it hard enough to traverse, even when they are friendly? And all yonder great mountain chains, left for you to cross, which we can at any time occupy in advance and render impossible? And all those rivers, on whose banks we can deal craftily by you, checking and controlling, and choosing the right number of you whom we care to fight? Nay, there are some which you will not be able to cross at all, unless we transport you to the other side." And, if at all these points we were worsted, yet fire, as they say, is stronger than the fruit of the field. We can burn it down and call up famine in arms against you, against which you, for all your bravery, will never be able to contend. Why, then, with all these avenues of attack, this machinery of war open to us, not one of which can be turned against ourselves, why should we select from among them all that method which alone in the sight of God is impious, and of man abominable. Surely it belongs to people altogether without resources, who are helplessly struggling in the toils of fate, and are villains to boot, to seek accomplishment of their desires by perjury to heaven and faithlessness to their fellows. We are not so unreasoning, Clericus, nor so foolish. Why, when we had it in our power to destroy you, did we not proceed to do it? Know well that the cause of this was nothing less than my passion to prove myself faithful to the Hellenes, and that, as Cyrus went up, relying on a foreign force attracted by payment, 
I, in turn, might go down strong in the same through service rendered. Various ways in which you Hellenes may be useful to me, you yourself have mentioned, but there is one still greater. It is the great king's privilege alone to wear the tiara upright upon his head. Yet, in your presence, it may be given to another mortal to wear it upright, here, upon his heart. Throughout this speech he seemed to Clearchus to be speaking the truth, and he rejoined, Then are not those worthy of the worst penalties who, in spite of all that exists to cement our friendship, endeavour by slander to make us enemies? Even so, replied Tissaphernes, and if your generals and captains care to come in some open and public way, I will name to you those who tell me that you are plotting against me and the army under me. Good, replied Clearchus, I will bring all, and I will show you on my side the source from which I derive my information concerning you. After this conversation, Tissaphernes, with kindliest expression, invited Clearchus to remain with him at the time, and entertained him at dinner. Next day, Clearchus returned to the camp, and made no secret of his persuasion that he, at any rate, stood high in the affections of Tissaphernes, and he reported what he had said insisting that those invited ought to go to Tissaphernes, and that any Hellene convicted of calumnious language ought to be punished, not only as traitors themselves, but as disaffected to their fellow countrymen. The slanderer and traducer was Menon. So, at any rate, he suspected, because he knew that he had had meetings with Tissaphernes whilst he was with Arias, and was factiously opposed to himself, plotting how to win over the whole army to him, as a means of winning the good graces of Tissaphernes. But Clearchus wanted the entire army to give its mind to no one else, and that refractory people should be put out of the way. Some of the soldiers protested. The captains and generals had better not all go. It was better not to put too much confidence in Tissaphernes. But Clearchus insisted so strongly that finally it was arranged for five generals to go and twenty captains. These were accompanied by about two hundred of the other soldiers, who took the opportunity of marketing. On arrival at the doors of Tissaphernes's quarters, the generals were summoned inside. They were Proxenus the Boeotian, Menon the Thessalian, Aegis the Arcadian, Clearchus the Laconian, and Socrates the Achaean, while the captains remained at the doors. Not long after that, at one and the same signal, those within were seized and those without cut down, after which some of the barbarian horsemen galloped over the plain, killing every Hellene they encountered, bond or free. The Hellenes, as they looked from the camp, viewed that strange horsemanship with surprise, and could not explain to themselves what it all meant, until Nicarchus the Arcadian came tearing along for bare life with a wound in the belly, and clutching his protruding entrails in his hands. He told them all that had happened. Instantly the Hellenes ran to their arms, one and all, in utter consternation, and fully expecting that the enemy would instantly be down upon the camp. However, they did not all come. Only Araeus came, and Arteoses, and Mithridates, who were Cyrus's most faithful friends. But the interpreter of the Hellenes said he saw and recognized the brother of Tissaphernes also with them. They had at their back other Persians also, armed with cuirasses as many as three hundred. As soon as they were within a short distance, they bade any general or captain of the Hellenes who might be there to approach and hear a message from the king. After this, two Hellene generals went out with all precaution. These were Cleonel, the Orchomenian, and Sophonitus, the Stymphalian, attended by Xenophon, the Athenian, who went to learn news of Proxenus. Chirisophus was at the time away in a village with a party gathering provisions. As soon as they had halted within earshot, Araeus said, Hellenes, Clearchus being shown to have committed perjury and to have broken the truce, has suffered the penalty, and he is dead. But Proxenus and Menon, in return for having given information of his treachery, are in high esteem and honour. As to yourselves, the king demands your arms. He claims them as his, since they belonged to Cyrus, who was his slave. To this the Hellenes made answer by the mouth of Cleonor of Orchomenus, their spokesman, who said, addressing Arius, Thou villain, Arius, and you the rest of you, who were Cyrus's friends, have you no shame before God or man, 
first to swear to us that you have the same friends and the same enemies as we ourselves, and then to turn and betray us, making common cause with Sophernus, that most impious and villainous of men. With him you have murdered the very man to whom you gave your solemn word and oath, and to the rest of us turned traitors, and, having so done, you join hand with our enemies to come against us. Araeus answered, There is no doubt but that Clearchus has been known for some time to harbour designs against Tisiphernus and Arontas, and all of us who side with them. Taking up this assertion, Xenophon said, Well, then, granting that Clearchus broke the truth, contrary to our oaths, he has his deserts, for perjurers deserve to perish. But where are Proxenus and Menon, our generals, and your good friends and benefactors, as you admit? Send them back to us. Surely, just because they are friends of both parties, they will try to give us the best advice for you and for us. At this, the Asiatics stood discussing with one another for a long while, and then they went away without vouchsaving a word. Number 6. The generals who were thus seized were taken up to the king, and there decapitated. The first of these, Clearchus, was a thorough soldier, and a true lover of fighting. This is the testimony of all who knew him intimately. As long as the war between the Lacedaemonians and Athenians lasted, he could find occupation at home, but after the peace he persuaded his own city that the Thracians were injuring the Hellenes, and having secured his object, set sail, empowered by the Ephorate, to make war upon the Thracians north of the Chersonese and Perinthus. But he had no sooner fairly started than, for some reason or other, the Ephors changed their minds, and endeavoured to bring him back again from the Isthmus. Thereupon he refused further obedience, and went off with sails set for the Hellespont. In consequence he was condemned to death by the Spartan authorities for disobedience to orders, and now, finding himself in exile, he came to Cyrus. Working on the feelings of that prince, in a language described elsewhere, he received from his entertainer a present of ten thousand derricks. Having got his money, he did not sink into a life of ease and indolence, but collected an army with it, carried on war against the Thracians, and conquered them in battle, and from that date onwards harried and plundered them with war incessantly, until Cyrus wanted his army, whereupon he at once went off, in hopes of finding another sphere of warfare in his company. These, I take it, were the characteristic acts of a man whose affections are set on warfare. When it is open to him to enjoy peace with honour, no shame, no injury attached, still he prefers war. When he may live at home at ease, he insists on toil, if only it may end in fighting. When it is given to him to keep his riches without risk, he would rather lessen his fortune by the pastime of battle. To put it briefly, war was his mistress. Just as another man will spend his fortune on a favourite, or to gratify some pleasure, so he chose to squander his substance on soldiering. But if the life of a soldier was a passion with him, he was none the less a soldier born, as herein appears. Danger was a delight to him. He courted it, attacking the enemy by night or by day, and in difficulties he did not lose his head, as all who ever served in a campaign with him would with one consent allow. A good soldier... The question arises, was he equally good as a commander? It must be admitted that, as far as was compatible with his quality of temper, he was, none more so, capable to a singular degree of devising how his army was to get supplies, and of actually getting them. He was also capable of impressing upon those about him that Clearchus must be obeyed, and that he brought about by the very hardness of his nature. With a scowling expression and a harshly grating voice, he chastised with severity, and at times with such fury that he was sorry afterwards himself for what he had done. Yet it was not without purpose that he applied the whip. He had a theory that there was no good to be got out of an unchastened army. A saying of his is regarded to the effect that the soldier who is to mount guard and keep his hands off his friends, and be ready to dash without a moment's hesitation against a foe, must fear his commander more than the enemy. Accordingly, in any strait, this was the man whom the soldiers were eager to obey, and they would have no other in his place. The cloud which lay upon his brow at those times lit up with brightness, his face became radiant, and the old sternness was so charged with vigour and knitted strength to meet the foe, that it savoured of salvation, not of cruelty. 
but when the pinch of danger was past and it was open to them to go and taste subordination under some other officer many forsook him so lacking in grace of manner was he but was ever harsh and savage so that the feeling of the soldiers towards him was that of schoolboys to a master in other words though it was not his good fortune ever to have followers inspired solely by friendship or good will yet those who found themselves under him either by state appointment or through want or other arch necessity yielded him implicit obedience from the moment that he led them to victory the elements which went to make his soldiers efficient were numerous enough there was the feeling of confidence in facing the foe which never left them and there was the dread of punishment at his hands to keep them orderly in this way and to this extent he knew how to rule but to play a subordinate part himself he had no great taste so at any rate it was said at the time of his death he must have been about fifty years of age proxenus the boeotian was of a different temperament it had been the dream of his boyhood to become a man capable of great achievements in obedience to this passionate desire it was that he paid his fee to gorgius of leontini after enjoying that teacher's society he flattered himself that he must be at once qualified to rule and while he was on friendly terms with the leaders of the age he was not to be outdone in reciprocity of service in this mood he threw himself into the projects of cyrus and in return expected to derive from this essay the reward of a great name large power and wide wealth but for all that he pitched his hopes so high, it was none the less evident that he would refuse to gain any of the ends he set before him wrongfully. Righteously and honourably he would obtain them, if he might, or else forego them. As a commander he had the art of leading gentlemen, but he failed to inspire adequately either respect for himself or fear in the soldiers under him. Indeed, he showed a more delicate regard for his soldiers than his subordinates for him and he was indisputably more apprehensive of incurring their hatred than they were of losing their fidelity. The one thing needful to real and recognized generalship was, he thought, to praise the virtues and to withhold praise from the evildoer. It can be easily understood, then, that of those who were brought in contact with him, the good and noble indeed were his well-wishers, but he laid himself open to the machinations of the base, who looked upon him as a person to be dealt with as they liked at the time of his death he was only thirty years of age as to menon the thessalian the mainspring of his action was obvious what he sought after insatiably was wealth rule he sought after only as a stepping-stone to larger spoils honours and high estate he craved for simply that he might extend the area of his gains and if he studied to be on friendly terms with the powerful it was in order that he might commit wrong with impunity the shortest road to the achievement of his desires lay, he thought, through false swearing, lying, and cheating, for in his vocabulary simplicity and truth were synonyms of folly. Natural affection he clearly entertained for nobody. If he called a man his friend, it might be looked upon as certain that he was bent on ensnaring him. Laughter at an enemy he considered out of place, but his whole conversation turned upon the ridicule of his associates. In like manner, the possessions of his foes were secure from his designs, since it was no easy task, he thought, to steal from people on their guard. But it was his particular good fortune to have discovered how easy it is to rob a friend in the midst of his security. If it were a perjured person or a wrongdoer, he dreaded him as well armed and entrenched, but the honourable and the truth-loving he tried to practice on, regarding them as weaklings devoid of manhood and as other men pride themselves on piety and truth and righteousness, so Menon prided himself on a capacity for fraud, on the fabrication of lies, on the mockery and scorn of friends. The man who was not a rogue he ever looked upon as only half-educated. Did he aspire to the first place in another man's friendship, he set about his object by slandering those who stood nearest to him in affection. He contrived to secure the obedience of his soldiers by making himself an accomplice in their misdeeds, and the fluency with which he vaunted his own capacity and readiness for enormous guilt was a sufficient title to be honoured and courted by them. Or, if any one stood aloof from him, he set it down as a meritorious act of kindness on his part that during their intercourse he had not robbed him of existence. As to certain obscure charges brought against his character, these may certainly be fabrications 
I confine myself to the following facts which are known to all. He was in the bloom of youth when he procured from Aristippus the command of his mercenaries. He had not yet lost that bloom when he became exceedingly intimate with Arias, a barbarian whose liking for fair young men was the explanation, and before he had grown a beard himself he had contracted a similar relationship with a bearded favourite named Therapes. When his fellow generals were put to death on the plea that they had marched with Cyrus against the king, he alone, although he had shared their conduct, was exempted from their fate. But after their death the vengeance of the king fell upon him, and he was put to death, not like Clearchus and the others, by what would appear to be the speediest of deaths, decapitation. But, as report says, he lived for a year in pain and disgrace, and died the death of a felon. Agais the Arcadian and Socrates the Archean were both among the sufferers who were put to death. To the credit, be it said, of both, no one ever derided either as cowardly in war. No one ever had a fault to find with either on the score of friendship. They were about thirty-five years of age. End of Book Two Book Three, Part One of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book Three, Part One. Number One. After the generals had been seized, and the captains and soldiers who formed their escort had been killed, the Hellens lay in deep perplexity, a prey to painful reflections. Here were they at the king's gates, and on every side environing them were many hostile cities and tribes of men. Who was there now to furnish them with a market? Separated from Hellas by more than a thousand miles, they had not even a guide to point the way. Impassable rivers lay athwart their homeward route, and hemmed them in. Betrayed even by the Asiatics, at whose side they had marched with Cyrus to the attack, they were left in isolation. Without a single mounted trooper to aid them in pursuit, was it not perfectly plain that if they won a battle, their enemies would escape to a man? But if they were beaten themselves, not one soul of them would survive." Haunted by such thoughts, and with hearts full of despair, but few of them tasted food that evening, but few of them kindled even a fire, and many never came into camp at all that night, but took their rest where each chanced to be. They could not close their eyes for very pain and yearning after their fatherlands or their parents, the wife or child whom they never expected to look upon again. Such was the plight in which each and all tried to seek repose. Now there was in that host a certain man, an Athenian, Xenophon, who had accompanied Cyrus neither as a general, nor as an officer, nor yet as a private soldier, but simply on the invitation of an old friend, Proxenus. This old friend had sent to fetch him from home, promising, if he would come, to introduce him to Cyrus, whom said Proxenus, I consider to be worth my fatherland and more to me. Xenophon, having read the letter, consulted Socrates, the Athenian, whether he should accept or refuse the invitation. Socrates, who had a suspicion that the state of Athens might in some way look askance at my friendship with Cyrus, whose zealous cooperation with the Lacedaemonians against Athens in the war was not forgotten, advised Xenophon to go to Delphi, and there to consult the god as to the desirability of such a journey. Xenophon went, and put the question to Apollo, to which of the gods he must pray and do sacrifice, so that he might best accomplish his intended journey, and return in safety with good fortune. Then Apollo answered him, To such and such gods must thou do sacrifice. And when he had returned home, he reported to Socrates the oracle. But he, when he heard, blamed Xenophon, that he had not, in the first instance, inquired of the god whether it were better for him to go or to stay, 
but had taken on himself to settle that point affirmatively, by inquiring straightway how he might best perform the journey. Since, however, continued Socrates, you did so put the question, you should do what the god enjoined. Thus, and without further ado, Xenophon offered sacrifice to those whom the god had named, and set sail on his voyage. He overtook Proxenus and Cyrus at Sardis, when they were just ready to start on the march up country, and was at once introduced to Cyrus. Proxenus eagerly pressed him to stop, a request which Cyrus with like ardour supported, adding that as soon as the campaign was over he would send him home. The campaign referred to was understood to be against the Pisidians. That is how Xenophon came to join the expedition, deceived indeed, though not by Proxenus, who was equally in the dark with the rest of the Hellens, not counting Clearchus, as to the intended attack upon the king. Then, though the majority were in apprehension of the journey, which was not at all to their minds, yet, for very shame of one another and Cyrus, they continued to follow him and with the rest went Xenophon. And now in this season of perplexity, he too, with the rest, was in sore distress, and could not sleep. But anon, getting a snatch of sleep, he had a dream. It seemed to him in a vision that there was a storm of thunder and lightning, and a bolt fell on his father's house, and thereupon the house was all in a blaze. He sprung up in terror, and pondering the matter, decided that in part the dream was good, in that he had seen a great light from Zeus, whilst in the midst of toil and danger. But partly too he feared it, for evidently it had come from Zeus the king, and the fire kindled all around. What could that mean but that he was hemmed in by various perplexities, and so could not escape from the country of the king? The full meaning, however, is to be discovered from what happened after the dream. This is what took place. As soon as he was fully awake, the first clear thought which came into his head was, Why am I lying here? The night advances. With the day it is like enough, the enemy will be upon us. If we are to fall into the hands of the king, what is left us but to face the most horrible of sights, and to suffer the most fearful pains, and then to die, insulted, an ignominious death? to defend ourselves, to ward off that fate, not a hand stirs, no one is preparing, none cares, but here we lie, as though it were time to rest and take our ease. I too, what am I waiting for? A general to undertake the work? And from what city? Am I waiting till I am older myself and of riper age? Older I shall never be, if today I betray myself to my enemies. Thereupon he got up, and called together first Proxenus's officers. And when they were met, he said, Sleep, sirs, I cannot, nor can you, I fancy, nor lie here longer, when I see in what straits we are. Our enemy, we may be sure, did not open war upon us till he felt he had everything amply ready. Yet none of us chose a corresponding anxiety to enter the lists of battle in the bravest style. And yet, if we yield ourselves and fall into the king's power, need we ask what our fate will be? This man, who, when his own brother, the son of the same parents, was dead, was not content with that, but severed head and hand from the body, and nailed them to a cross. We then, who have not even the tie of blood in our favour, but who marched against him, meaning to make a slave of him instead of a king, and to slay him if we could, what is likely to be our fate at his hands? Would he not go all lengths, so that, by inflicting on us the extreme of ignominy and torture, he may rouse in the rest of mankind a terror of ever marching against him any more? There is no question but that our business is to avoid by all means getting into his clutches. For my part, all the while the truce lasted, I never ceased pitying ourselves and congratulating the king and those with him, as, like a helpless spectator, I surveyed the extent and quality of their territory, the plenteousness of their provisions, the multitude of their dependents, their cattle, their gold, and their apparel. 
and then to turn and ponder the condition of our soldiers, without part or lot in these good things, except we bought it. Few I knew, had any longer the wherewithal to buy, and yet our oath held us down, so that we could not provide ourselves otherwise than by purchase. I say, as I reasoned thus, there were times when I dreaded the truce, more than I now dread war. Now, however, that they have abruptly ended the truce, there is an end also to their own insolence and to our suspicion. All these good things of theirs are now set as prizes for the competence. To whichsoever of us shall prove the better men, will they fall as guerdons, and the gods themselves are the judges of the strife. The gods, who full surely will be on our side, seeing it is our enemies who have taken their names falsely, whilst we, with much to lure us, yet for our oath's sake, and the gods who are our witnesses, sternly held aloof, so that, it seems to me, we have a right to enter upon this contest, with much more heart than our foes, and further, we are possessed of bodies more capable than theirs of bearing cold and heat and labour. Souls too we have, by the help of heaven, better and braver, Nay, the men themselves are more vulnerable, more mortal than ourselves, if so be the gods vouchsafe to give us victory once again. Howbeit, for I doubt not elsewhere similar reflections are being made, whatsoever betide, let us not in heaven's name wait for others to come and challenge us to noble deeds. Let us rather take the lead in stimulating the rest to valour. Show yourselves to be the bravest of officers, and among generals the worthiest to command. For myself, if you choose to start forwards on this quest, I will follow. Or, if you bid me lead you, my age shall be no excuse to stand between me and your orders. At least I am of full age, I take it, to avert misfortune from my own head. Such were the speaker's words and the officers when they heard all with one exception called upon him to put himself at their head this was a certain apollonides there present who spoke in the boeotian dialect this man's opinion was that it was mere nonsense for any one to pretend they could obtain safety otherwise than by an appeal to the king if he had skill to enforce it and at the same time he began to dilate on the difficulties but xenophon cut him short o oh, most marvellous of men though you have eyes to see you do not perceive though you have ears to hear you do not recollect you were present with the rest of us now here when after the death of cyrus the king vaunting himself on that occurrence sent dictatorially to bid us lay down our arms but when we instead of giving up our arms put them on and went and pitched our camp near him his manner changed it is hard to say what he did not do he was so at his wit's end sending us embassies and begging for a truce and furnishing provisions the while until he had got it or to take the contrary instance when just now acting precisely on your principles our generals came and captains went trusting to the truce unarmed to a conference with them what came of it what is happening at this instant beaten goaded with pricks insulted poor souls they cannot even die though death i ween would be very sweet and you who know all this how can you say that it is mere nonsense to talk of self-defence how can you bid us go again and try the arts of persuasion in my opinion sirs we ought not to admit this fellow to the same rank with ourselves rather ought we to deprive him of his captaincy and load him with packs and treat him as such the man is a disgrace to his own fatherland and the whole of hellas that being a hellen he is what he is here Agassius, the Stymphalian, broke in, exclaiming, Nay, this fellow has no connection either with Boeotia or with Hellas, none whatever. I have noted both his ears bored like a Lydian's. And so it was. Him then they banished. But the rest visited the ranks, and wherever a general was left, they summoned the general. Where he was gone, the lieutenant-general. And where again the captain alone was left, the captain. As soon as they were all met, they seated themselves in front of the place d'armes, the assembled generals and officers, numbering about a hundred. It was nearly midnight when this took place. 
Thereupon Hieronymus the Elian, the eldest of Proxenus's captains, commenced speaking as follows. Generals and captains, it seemed right to us, in view of the present crisis, ourselves to assemble and to summon you, that we might advise upon some practicable course. Would you, Xenophon, repeat what you said to us? Thereupon Xenophon spoke as follows. We all know only too well that the king and Tissaphernes have seized as many of us as they could, and it is clear they are plotting to destroy the rest of us if they can. Our business is plain. It is to do all we can to avoid getting into the power of the barbarians. Rather, if we can, we will get them into our power. Rely upon this, then, all you who are here assembled. Now is your great opportunity. The soldiers outside have their eyes fixed upon you. If they think that you are faint-hearted, they will turn cowards. But if you show them that you are making your own preparations to attack the enemy and setting an example to the rest, follow you, be assured, they will. Imitate you, they will. Maybe it is but right and fair that you should somewhat excel them, for you are generals, you are commanders of brigades or regiments. And if, while it was peace, you had the advantage in wealth and position, so now, when it is war, you are expected to rise superior to the common herd, to think for them, to toil for them, whenever there be need. At this very moment, you would confer a great boon on the army, if you made it your business to appoint generals and officers to fill the places of those that are lost. For without leaders nothing good or noble, to put it concisely, was ever wrought anywhere. And in military matters this is absolutely true. For if discipline is held to be of saving virtue, the want of it has been the ruin of many ere now. Well then, when you have appointed all the commanders necessary, it would only be opportune, I take it, if you were to summon the rest of the soldiers and speak some words of encouragement. Even now, I dare say, you noticed yourselves the crestfallen air with which they came into camp, the despondency with which they fell to picket duty, so that, unless there is a change for the better, I do not know for what service they will be fit, whether by night, if need were, or even by day. The thing is to get them to turn their thoughts to what they mean to do, instead of to what they are likely to suffer. Do that, and their spirits will soon revive wonderfully. You know, I need hardly remind you, it is not numbers or strength that gives victory in war, but, heaven helping them to one or other of two competents, it is given to dash with stouter hearts to meet the foe, and such onset, in nine cases out of ten, those others refuse to meet. This observation also I have laid to heart, that they who in matters of war seek in all ways to save their lives are just they who, as a rule, die dishonourably, whereas they who, recognising that death is the common lot and destiny of all men, strive hard to die nobly. These more frequently, as I observe, do after all attain to old age, or at any rate, while life lasts, they spend their days more happily. This lesson let all lay to heart this day, for we are just at such a crisis of our fate. Now is the season to be brave ourselves, and to stimulate the rest by our example. With these words he ceased, and after him Carisophus said, Xenophon, hitherto I knew only so much of you as that you were, I heard, an Athenian. But now I must commend you for your words and for your conduct. I hope that there may be many more like you, for it would prove a public blessing. Then turning to the officers, And now, said he, let us waste no time. Retire at once, I beg you, and choose leaders where you need them. After you have made your elections, come back to the middle of the camp and bring the newly appointed officers. After that, we will there summon a general meeting of the soldiers. Let Tolmides the herald, he added, be in attendance. With these words on his lips, he got up, in order that what was needful might be done at once without delay. After this, the generals were chosen. These were Timasian the Dardanian, in place of Cleochus, Xanthocles, an Achaean, 
in place of Socrates, Cleano, an Arcadian, in place of Agius, Philesius, an Achaean, in place of Menon, and in place of Proxenus, Xenophon, the Athenian. End of Book 3, Part 1《Book Three, Part Two of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Anabasis by Xenophon, translated by H. G. Dakins. Book Three, Part Two. Number Two. By the time the new generals had been chosen, the first faint glimmer of dawn had hardly commenced, as they met in the centre of the camp, and resolved to post an advance guard, and to call a general meeting of the soldiers. Now, when these had come together, Carisophus, the Lacedaemonian, first rose and spoke as follows. Fellow soldiers, the present posture of affairs is not pleasant seeing that we are robbed of so many generals and captains and soldiers. And more than that, our former allies, Arius and his men, have betrayed us. Still, we must rise above our circumstances to prove ourselves brave men, and not give in, but try to save ourselves by glorious victory if we can. Or if not, at least to die gloriously, and never, while we have breath in our bodies, fall into the hands of our enemies, in which latter case, I fear, we shall suffer things which I pray the gods may visit rather upon those we hate. At this point, Cleanor, the Archimenean, stood up and spoke as follows. You see, men, the perjury and the impiety of the king. You see the faithlessness of Tissaphernes professing that he was next-door neighbour to Hellas, and would give a good deal to save us, in confirmation of which he took an oath to us himself, he gave us the pledge of his right hand, and then, with a lie upon his lips, this same man turned round and arrested our generals. He had no reverence even for Zeus, the god of strangers. But, after entertaining Cleartus at his own board as a friend, he used his hospitality to delude and decoy his victims. And Arius, whom we offered to make king, with whom we exchanged pledges not to betray each other, even this man, without a particle of fear of the gods, or respect for Cyrus in his grave, though he was most honoured by Cyrus in lifetime, even he has turned aside to the worst foes of Cyrus, and is doing his best to injure the dead man's friends. Them may the gods requite as they deserve. But we, with these things before our eyes, will not any more be cheated and cajoled by them. We will make the best fight we can, and having made it, whatever the gods think fit to send, we will accept. After him, Xenophon arose. He was arrayed for war in his bravest apparel. For, said he to himself, if the gods grant victory, the finest attire will match with victory best, or if I must needs die, then for one who has aspired to be the noblest, it is well there should be some outward correspondence between his expectation and his end. He began his speech as follows. Cleanor has spoken of the perjury and faithlessness of the barbarians, and you yourselves know them only too well, I fancy. If, then, we are minded to enter a second time into terms of friendship with them, with the experience of what our generals, who in all confidence entrusted themselves to their power, have suffered, reason would we should feel deep despondency. If, on the other hand, we purpose to take our good swords in our hands and to inflict punishment on them for what they have done, and from this time forward will be on terms of downright war with them, then, God helping, we have many a bright hope of safety. 
the words were scarcely spoken, when someone sneezed, and with one impulse the soldiers bowed in worship, and Xenophon proceeded. I propose, sirs, since, even as we spoke of safety, an omen from Zeus the Saviour has appeared, we vow a vow to sacrifice to the Saviour thank-offerings for safe deliverance, wheresoever first we reach a friendly country. And let us couple with that vow another of individual assent, that we will offer to the rest of the gods according to our ability. Let all those who are in favour of this proposal hold up their hands. They all held up their hands, and there and then they vowed a vow and chanted the battle hymn. But as soon as these sacred matters were duly ended, he began once more thus, I was saying that many and bright are the hopes we have of safety. First of all, we it is who confirm and ratify the oaths we take by heaven. But our enemies have taken false oaths and broken the truce, contrary to their solemn word. This being so, it is but natural that the gods should be opposed to our enemies, but with ourselves allied the gods who were able to make the great ones quickly small, and out of sore perplexity can save the little ones with ease, what time it pleases them. In the next place, let me recall to your minds the dangers of our own forefathers, that you may see and know that bravery is your heirloom, and that by the aid of the gods, brave men are rescued, even out of the midst of sorest straits. So was it when the Persians came, and their attendant hosts, with a very great armament, to wipe out Athens from the face of the earth. The men of Athens had the heart to withstand them, and conquered them. Then they vowed to Artemis that for every man they slew of the enemy, they would sacrifice to the goddess goats so many, and when they could not find sufficient for the slain, they resolved to offer yearly five hundred and to this day they perform that sacrifice. And at a somewhat later date, when Xerxes assembled his countless hosts and marched upon Hellas, then too our fathers conquered the forefathers of our foes by land and by sea. And proofs of these things are yet to be seen in trophies, but the greatest witness of all is the freedom of our cities, the liberty of that land in which you were born and bred. For you call no man master or lord. You bow your heads to none save to the gods alone. Such were your forefathers, and their sons are ye. Think not I am going to say that you put to shame in any way your ancestry. Far from it. Not many days since, you too were drawn up in battle face to face with these true descendants of their ancestors. And by the help of heaven, you conquered them, though they many times outnumbered you. At that time, it was to win a throne for Cyrus that you showed your bravery. Today, when the struggle is for your own salvation, what is more natural than that you should show yourselves braver and more zealous still? Nay, it is very meet and right that you should be more undaunted still to-day to face the foe. The other day, though you had not tested them, and before your eyes lay their immeasurable host, you had the heart to go against them with the spirit of your fathers. To-day you have made trial of them, and knowing that, however many times your number, they do not care to await your onset. What concern have you now to be afraid of them? Nor let any one suppose that herein is a point of weakness, in that Cyrus's troops, who before were drawn up by your side, have now deserted us, for they are even worse cowards still than those we worsted. At any rate, they have deserted us, and sought refuge with them. Leaders of the forlorn hope of flight. Far better is it to have them brigaded with the enemy than shoulder to shoulder in our ranks. 
but if any of you is out of heart to think that we have no cavalry while the enemy have many squadrons to command lay to heart this doctrine that ten thousand horse only equal ten thousand men upon their backs neither less nor more did any one ever die in battle from the bite or kick of a horse it is the men the real swordsmen who do whatever is done in battles in fact we on our stout shanks are better mounted than those cavalry fellows there they hang on to their horses necks in mortal dread not only of us but of falling off while we well planted upon earth can deal far heavier blows to our assailants and aim more steadily at who we will there is one point i admit in which their cavalry have the whip hand of us it is safer for them than it is for us to run away maybe however you're in good heart about the fighting but annoyed to think that tissaphernes will not guide us any more and that the king will not furnish us with a market any longer now consider is it better for us to have a guide like tissaphernes whom we know to be plotting against us or to take our chance of the stray people whom we catch and compel to guide us who will know that any mistake made in leading us will be a sad mistake for their own lives again is it better to be buying provisions in a market of their providing, in scant measure, and at high prices, without even the money to pay for them any longer, or, by right of conquest, to help ourselves, applying such measure as suits our fancy best? Or again, perhaps you admit that our present position is not without its advantages, but you feel sure that the rivers are a difficulty, and think that you were never more taken in than when you crossed them. If so, consider whether, after all, this is not perhaps the most foolish thing which the barbarians have done. No river is impassable throughout. Whatever difficulties it may present at some distance from its source, you need only make your way up to the springhead and there you may cross it without wetting more than your ankles. But granted that the rivers do bar our passage, and that guides are not forthcoming, what care we? We need feel no alarm for all that. We have heard of the Mysians, a people whom we certainly cannot admit to be better than ourselves, and yet they inhabit numbers of large and prosperous cities in the king's own country without asking leave. The Pisidians are an equally good instance of the Lycaonians. We have seen with our own eyes how they fare, seizing fortresses down in the plains and reaping the fruits of these men's territory. As to us, I go so far as to assert, we ought never to have let it be seen that we were bent on getting home. At any rate, not so soon. We should have begun stocking and furnishing ourselves, as if we fully meant to settle down for life somewhere or other hereabouts. I am sure that the king would be thrice glad to give the Mysians as many guides as they like, or as many hostages as they care to demand, in return for a safe conduct out of his country. He would make carriage roads for them, and if they preferred to take their departure in coaches and four, he would not say them nay. So too, I am sure, he would be only too glad to accommodate us in the same way if he saw us preparing to settle down here. But perhaps it is just as well that we did not stop, for I fear if once we learn to live in idleness and to batten in luxury and dalliance with these tall and handsome median and persian women and maidens we shall be like the lotus eaters and forget the road home altogether it seems to me that it is only right in the first instance 
to make an effort to return to Hellas, and to revisit our hearths and homes, if only to prove to other Hellens that it is their own faults if they are poor and needy, seeing it is in their power to give to those now living a pauper life at home a free passage hither, and convert them into well-to-do burghers at once. Now, sirs, is it not clear that all these good things belong to whoever has strength to hold them? Let us look another matter in the face. How are we to march most safely? Or where blows are needed, how are we to fight to the best advantage? That is the question. The first thing which I recommend is to burn the wagons we have got, so that we may be free to march wherever the army needs, and not, practically, make our baggage train our general. And next, we should throw our tents into the bonfire also, for these again are only a trouble to carry, and do not contribute one grain of good either for fighting or getting provisions. Further, let us get rid of all superfluous baggage, save only what we require for the sake of war or meat and drink, so that as many of us as possible may be under arms, and as few as possible doing porterage. I need not remind you that, in case of defeat, the owner's goods are not their own. But if we master our foes, we will make them our baggage bearers. It only rests for me to name the one thing which I look upon as the greatest of all. You see, the enemy did not dare to bring war to bear upon us until they had first seized our generals. They felt that whilst our rulers were there, and we obeyed them, they were no match for us in war. But having got hold of them, they fully expected that the consequent confusion and anarchy would prove fatal to us. What follows? This. Officers and leaders ought to be more vigilant ever than their predecessors subordinates still more orderly and obedient to those in command now than even they were to those who are gone and you should pass a resolution that in case of insubordination any one who stands by is to aid the officer in chastising the offender so the enemy will be mightily deceived for on this day they will behold ten thousand cleartuses instead of one who will not suffer one man to play the coward. And now it is high time I brought my remarks to an end, for maybe the enemy will be here anon. Let those who are in favour of these proposals confirm them with all speed, that they may be realised in fact, or if any other cause seem better, let not any one, even though he be a private soldier, shrink from proposing it, our common safety is our common need. After this, Carisophus spoke. He said, If there is anything else to be done, beyond what Xenophon has mentioned, we shall be able to carry it out presently. But with regard to what he has already proposed, it seems to me the best course to vote upon the matters at once, those who are in favour of Xenophon's proposals hold up their hands. They all held them up. Xenophon rose again and said, Listen, sirs, while I tell you what I think we have need of besides, it is clear that we must march where we can get provisions. Now I am told there are some splendid villages not more than two miles and a half distant. I should not be surprised then if the enemy were to hang on our heels and dog us as we retire, like cowardly curs which rush out at the passer-by and bite him if they can. But when you turn upon them, they run away. Such will be their tactics, I take it. It may be safer, then, to march in a hollow square, so as to place the baggage animals and our mob of suitlers in greater security. 
it will save time to make the appointments at once, and to settle who leads the square and directs the vanguard, who will take command of the two flanks and who of the rear guard, so that, when the enemy appears, we shall not need to deliberate, but can at once set in motion the machinery in existence. If any one has any better plan, we need not adopt mine. But if not, suppose Carisophus takes the lead, as he is a Lacedaemonian, and the two eldest generals take in charge the two wings respectively, while Timasian and I, the two youngest, will for the present guard the rear. For the rest, we can but make experiment of this arrangement, and alter it with deliberation, as from time to time any improvement suggests itself. If any one has a better plan to propose, let him do so. No dissentient voice was heard. Accordingly, he said, those in favour of this resolution hold up their hands. The resolution was carried. And now, said he, it would be well to separate and carry out what we have decreed. If any of you has set his heart on seeing his friends again, let him remember to prove himself a man. There is no other way to achieve his heart's wish. Or is mere living an object with any of you? Strive to conquer. If to slay is the privilege of victory, to die is the doom of the defeated. Or perhaps to gain money and wealth is your ambition. Strive again for mastery. Have not conquerors the double gain of keeping what is their own, whilst they seize the possessions of the vanquished? Number three. The speaking was ended. They got up and retired. Then they burnt the wagons and the tents, and after sharing with one another what each needed out of their various superfluities, they threw the remnant into the fire. Having done that, they proceeded to make their breakfasts. While they were breakfasting, Mithridates came with about thirty horsemen, and summoning the generals within earshot, he thus addressed them. Men of Hellas, I have been faithful to Cyrus, as you know well, and today I am your well-wisher. Indeed, I am here spending my days in great fear. If then I could see any salutary course in prospect, I should be disposed to join you with all my retainers. Please inform me, then, as to what you propose regarding me as your friend and well-wisher anxious only to pursue his march in your company. The generals held counsel, and resolved to give the following answer, Carisophus acting as spokesman. We have resolved to make our way through the country, inflicting the least possible damage, provided we are allowed a free passage homewards. But if any one tries to hinder us, he will have to fight it out with us, and we shall bring all the force in our power to bear. Thereat, Mithridates set himself to prove to them that their deliverance, except with the king's good pleasure, was hopeless. Then the meaning of his mission was plain. He was an agent in disguise. In fact, a relation of Tissaphernes was in attendance to keep a check on his loyalty. After that, the generals resolved that it would be better to proclaim open war, without truce or herald, as long as they were in the enemy's country. For they used to come and corrupt the soldiers, and they were even successful with one officer, Nicarchus, an Arcadian, who went off in the night with about twenty men. After this, they breakfasted and crossed the river Zapatas, marching in regular order, with a beast and mob of the army in the middle. They had not advanced far on their route, when Mithridates made his appearance again, with about a couple of hundred horsemen at his back, and bowmen and slingers twice as many, as nimble fellows as a man might hope to see. He approached the Hellens as if he were friendly. But when they had got fairly to close quarters, all of a sudden some of them, whether mounted or on foot, began shooting with their bows and arrows, and another set with slings, wounding the men. 
the rearguard of the Hellens suffered for a while severely without being able to retaliate, for the Cretans had a shorter range than the Persians, and at the same time, being light-armed troops, they lay cooped up within the ranks of the heavy infantry, while the javelin men again did not shoot far enough to reach the enemy's slingers. This being so, Xenophon thought there was nothing for it but to charge, and charge they did, some of the heavy and light infantry who were guarding the rear with him, but for all their charging they did not catch a single man. The dearth of cavalry told against the Hellens, nor were their infantry able to overhaul the enemy's infantry, with a long start they had, and considering the shortness of the race, for it was out of the question to pursue them far from the main body of the army. On the other hand, the Asiatic cavalry, even while fleeing, poured volleys of arrows behind their backs and wounded the pursuers, while the Hellens must fall back fighting every step of the way they had measured in the pursuit, so that by the end of that day they had not gone much more than three miles, but in the late afternoon they reached the villages. Here there was a return of the old despondency. Carisophus and the eldest of the generals blamed Xenophon for leaving the main body to give chase and endangering himself thereby, while he could not damage the enemy one whit the more. Xenophon admitted that they were right in blaming him. No better proof of that was wanted than the result. The fact is, he added, I was driven to pursue. It was too trying to look on and see our men suffer so badly, and be unable to retaliate. However, when we did charge, there is no denying the truth of what you say. We were not a whit more able to injure the enemy, while we had considerable difficulty in beating a retreat ourselves. Thank heaven they did not come upon us in any great force, but were only a handful of men, so that the injury they did us was not large, as it might have been, and at least it has served to show us what we need. At present, the enemy shoot and sling beyond our range, so that our Cretan archers are no match for them. Our hand-throwers cannot reach as far, and when we pursue, it is not possible to push the pursuit to any great distance from the main body, and within the short distance no foot-soldier, however fleet of foot, could overtake another foot-soldier who has a bow-shot the start of him. If, then, we are to exclude them from all possibility of injuring us as we march, we must get slingers as soon as possible, and cavalry. I am told there are in the army some Rodians, most of whom, they say, know how to sling and their missile will reach even twice as far as the Persian slings, which on account of their being loaded with stones as big as one's fist have a comparatively short range, but the Rhodians are skilled in the use of leaden bullets. Suppose, then, we investigate and find out first of all who among them possess slings, and for these slings offer the owner the money value and to another who will plat some more, hand over the money price, and for a third who will volunteer to be enrolled as a slinger, invent some other sort of privilege, I think we shall soon find people to come forward capable of helping us. There are horses in the army I know, some few with myself, others belonging to Cleartius's stud, and a good many others captured from the enemy, used for carrying baggage. Let us take the pick of these, supplying their places by ordinary baggage animals, and equipping the horses for cavalry. I should not wonder if our troopers gave some annoyance to these fugitives. These proposals were carried, and that night two hundred slingers were enrolled, and next day as many as fifty horse and horsemen passed muster as duly qualified. Buff jackets and cuirasses were provided for them, and a commandant of cavalry appointed to command, Lycius, the son of Polystratus by name, an Athenian. End of Book 3 Part 2
of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 3, Part 3. Number 4. That day they remained inactive, but the next they rose earlier than usual, and set out betimes, for they had a ravine to cross, where they feared the enemy might attack them in the act of crossing. When they were across, Mithridates appeared again with one thousand horse, and archers and slingers to the number of four thousand. This whole body he had got by request from Tissaphernes, and in return he undertook to deliver up the Hellens to Tissaphernes. He had grown contemptuous since his late attack, when with so small a detachment he had done, as he thought, a good deal of mischief, without the slightest loss to himself. When the Hellens were not only right across, but had got about a mile from the ravine, Mithridates also crossed with his forces. An order had been passed down the lines, what light infantry and what heavy infantry were to take part in the pursuit and the cavalry were instructed to follow up the pursuit with confidence, as a considerable support was in their rear. So, when Mithridates had come up with them, and they were well within arrow and slingshot, the bugle sounded the signal to the Hellens, and immediately the detachment under orders rushed to close quarters, and the cavalry charged. There the enemy preferred not to wait, but fled towards the ravine. In this pursuit the Asiatics lost several of their infantry killed, and of their cavalry as many as eighteen were taken prisoners in the ravine. As to those who were slain, the Hellens, acting upon impulse, mutilated their bodies, by way of impressing their enemy with as frightful an image as possible. So fared the foe, and so fell back but the Hellens, continuing their march in safety for the rest of that day, reached the river Tigris. Here they came upon a large deserted city, the name of which was Larissa, a place inhabited by the Medes in days of old. The breadth of its walls was twenty-five feet, and the height of them a hundred, and the circuit of the whole two parasangs. It was built of clay bricks, supported on a stone basis twenty feet high. This city the king of the Persians besieged, what time the Persians strove to snatch their empire from the Medes. But he could in no wise take it. Then a cloud hid the face of the sun, and blotted out the light thereof, until the inhabitants were gone out of the city, and so it was taken. By the side of this city there was a stone pyramid in breadth a hundred feet, and in height two hundred feet. In it were many of the barbarians who had fled for refuge from the neighbouring villages. From this place they marched one stage of six parasangs to a great deserted fortress, which lay over against the city, and the name of that city was Mespilla. The Medes once dwelt in it. The basement was made of polished stone full of shelves. Fifty feet was the breadth of it, and fifty feet the height, and on this basement was reared a wall of brick, the breadth whereof was fifty feet, and the height thereof four hundred, and the circuit of the wall was six parasangs. Hither, as the story goes, Media, the king's wife, betook herself in flight what time the Medes lost their empire at the hands of the Persians. To this city also the king of the Persians laid siege, but could not take it either by length of days or strength of hand. But Zeus, sent amazement on the inhabitants thereof, and so it was taken. From this place they marched one stage, for Parasangs. But while still on this stage, Tissaphernes made his appearance. He had with him his own cavalry, and a force belonging to Arantas, who had the king's daughter to wife, and there were, moreover, with them the Asiatics whom Cyrus had taken with him on his march up together with those whom the king's brother had brought as a reinforcement to the king, besides those whom Tissaphernes himself had received as a gift from the king, so that the armament appeared to be very great. When they were close, he halted some of his regiments at the rear, 
and wheeled others into position on either flank, but hesitated to attack, having no mind, apparently, to run any risks, and contenting himself with an order to his slingers to sling, and his archers to shoot. But when the Rhodian slingers and the bowmen, posted at intervals, retaliated, and every shot told, for, with the utmost pains to miss, it would have been hard to do so under the circumstances. Then Tissaphernes, with all speed, retired out of range, the other regiments following suit, and for the rest of the day the one party advanced, and the other followed. But now the Asiatics had ceased to be dangerous with their sharp-shooting, for the Rhodians could reach further than the Persian slingers, or, indeed, than most of the bowmen. The Persian bows are of great size, so that the Cretans found the arrows which were picked up serviceable, and persevered in using their enemies' arrows, and practised shooting with them, letting them fly upwards to a great height. There were also plenty of bowstrings found in the villages, and lead, which they turned to account for their slings. As a result of this day, then, the Hellens chancing upon some villages had no sooner encamped than the barbarians fell back, having had distinctly the worst of it in the skirmishing. The next day was a day of inaction. They halted and took in supplies, as there was much corn in the villages. But on the day following, the march was continued through the plain of the Tigris, and Tissaphernes still hung on their skirts with his skirmishers. And now it was that the Hellens discovered the defect of marching in a square with an enemy following. As a matter of necessity, whenever the wings of an army so disposed draw together, either where a road narrows or hills close in, or a bridge has to be crossed, the heavy infantry cannot help being squeezed out of their ranks, and march with difficulty, partly from actual pressure, and partly from the general confusion that ensues. Or, supposing the wings are again extended, the troops have hardly recovered from their former distress before they are pulled asunder, and there is a wide space between the wings, and the men concerned lose confidence in themselves, especially with an enemy close behind. What happened, when a bridge had to be crossed or other passage effected, was that each unit of the force pressed on in anxiety to get over first, and at these moments it was easy for the enemy to make an attack. The generals accordingly, having recognised the defect, set about curing it. To do so, they made six loci, or divisions of a hundred men apiece, each of which had its own set of captains and under-officers, in command of half and quarter companies. It was the duty of these new companies, during a march, whenever the flanks needed to close in, to fall back to the rear, so as to disencumber the wings. This they did by wheeling clear of them. When the sides of the oblong again extended, they filled up the interstices, if the gap were narrow, by columns of companies, if broader, by columns of half-companies, or, if broader still, by columns of quarter-companies, so that the space between was always filled up. If again it were necessary to effect a passage by bridge or otherwise, there was no confusion, the several companies crossing in turns, or, if the occasion arose to form in line of battle, these companies came up to the front and fell in. In this way they advanced four stages, but ere the fifth was completed, they came in sight of a palace of some sort, with villages clustered round it. They could further see that the road leading to this place pursued its course over high undulating hillocks, the spur of the mountain range, under which lay the village. These knolls were a welcome sight to the Hellens, naturally enough, as the enemy were cavalry. However, when they had issued from the plain and ascended the first crest, and were in the act of descending it so as to mount the next, at this juncture the barbarians came upon them. From the high ground down the sheer steep they poured a volley of darts, slingstones, and arrows, which they discharged under the lash, wounding many, until they got the better of the Hellenic light troops, and drove them for shelter behind the heavy infantry, 
so that this day that arm was altogether useless, huddling in the mob of sutlers, both slingers and archers alike. But when the Hellens, being so pressed, made an attempt to pursue, they could barely scale to the summit, being heavy-armed troops, while the enemy as lightly sprung away, and they suffered similarly in retiring to join the rest of the army. And then, on the second hill, the whole had to be gone through again, so that when it came to the third hillock, they determined not to move the main body of troops from their position until they had brought up a squadron of light infantry from the right flank of the square to a point on the mountain range. When this detachment were once posted above their pursuers, the latter desisted from attacking the main body in its descent, for fear of being cut off and finding themselves between two assailants. Thus the rest of the day, they moved on in two divisions, one set keeping to the road by the hillocks, the other marching parallel on the higher level along the mountains, and thus they reached the villages and appointed eight surgeons to attend to the many wounded. Here they halted three days for the sake of the wounded chiefly, while a further inducement was the plentiful supply of provisions which they found, wheat and wine, and large stores of barley laid up for horses. These supplies had been collected by the ruling satrap of the country. On the fourth day they began their descent into the plain, but when Tissaphernes overtook them, necessity taught them to camp in the first village they caught sight of, and give over the attempt of marching and fighting simultaneously, as so many were hors de combat, being either on the list of wounded themselves, or else engaged in carrying the wounded, or laden with the heavy arms of those so occupied but when they were once encamped and the barbarians advancing upon the village made an attempt to harass them with their sharp shooters the superiority of the hellens was pronounced to sustain a running fight with an enemy constantly attacking was one thing to keep him at arm's length from a fixed base of action another and the difference was much in their favour but when it was late afternoon the time had come for the enemy to withdraw since the habit of the barbarian was never to encamp within seven or eight miles of the Hellenic camp. This he did in apprehension of a night attack, for a Persian army is good for nothing at night. Their horses are halted, and, as a rule, hobbled as well, to prevent their escaping, as they might if loose, so that, if any alarm occurs, the trooper has to saddle and bridle his horse, and then he must put on his own cuirass, and then mount, or which performances are difficult at night and in the midst of confusion. For this reason they always encamped at a distance from the Hellens. When the Hellens perceived that they were preparing to retire, and that the order was being given, the herald's cry, Pack up for starting! might be heard before the enemy was fairly out of earshot. For a while the Asiatics paused, as if unwilling to be gone, but as night closed in, off they went, for it did not suit their notions of expediency to set off on a march and arrive by night. And now, when the Hellens saw that they were really and clearly gone, they too broke up their camp, and pursued their march till they had traversed seven and a half miles. Thus the distance between the two armies grew to be so great that the next day the enemy did not appear at all, nor yet on the third day. But on the fourth, the barbarians had pushed on by a forced night march and occupied a commanding position on the right, where the Hellens had to pass. It was a narrow mountain spur, overhanging the descent into the plain. But when Carisophus saw that this ridge was occupied, he summoned Xenophon from the rear, bidding him at the same time to bring up peltasts to the front. That Xenophon hesitated to do, for Tissaphernes and his whole army were coming up and were well within sight. Galloping up to the front himself, he asked, Why do you summon me? The other answered him, The reason is plain. Look yonder. This crest which overhangs our descent has been occupied. There is no passing until we have dislodged these fellows. Why have you not brought up the light infantry? Xenophon explained. He had not thought it desirable to leave the rear unprotected, with an enemy appearing in the field of view 
However, it is time, he added, to decide how we are to dislodge these fellows from the crest. At this moment his eye fell on the peak of the mountain, rising immediately above their army, and he could see an approach leading from it to the crest in question where the enemy lay. He exclaimed, The best thing we can do, Carisophus, is to make a dash at the height itself, and with what speed we may. If we take it, the party in command of the road will never be able to stop. If you like, stay in command of the army and I will go. Or if you prefer, do you go to the mountain and I will stay here. I leave it to you, Carisophus answered, to choose which you like best. Xenophon remarking, I am the younger, elected to go. But he stipulated for a detachment from the front to accompany him, since it was a long way to fetch up troops from the rear. Accordingly, Carisophus furnished him with the light infantry from the front reoccupying their place by those from the centre. He also gave him to form part of the detachment, the three hundred of the picked corps under his own command at the head of the square. They set out from the low ground with all the haste imaginable, but the enemy in position on the crest no sooner perceived their advance upon the summit of the pass than they themselves set off full tilt in a rival race for the summit too. Hoarse were the shouts of the Hellenic troops as the men cheered their companions forwards, and hoarse the answering shouts from the troops of Tissaphernes urging on theirs. Xenophon, mounted on his charger, rode beside his men, and roused their ardour the while. Now for it, brave sirs, bethink you that this race is for Hellas, now or never, to find your boys, your wives, one small effort, and the rest of the march we shall pursue in peace, without ever a blow to strike. Now for it! But Soteridas the Sicyonian said, We are not on equal terms, Xenophon. You are mounted on a horse. I can hardly get along with my shield to carry. And he, on hearing the reproach, leapt from his horse. In another instant he had pushed Soteridas from the ranks, snatched from him his shield, and begun marching as quickly as he might under the circumstances, having his horseman's cuirass to carry as well, so that he was sore pressed. But he continued to cheer on the troops, exhorting those in front to lead on, and the men toiling behind to follow up. Soteridas was not spared by the rest of the men. They gave him blows, they pelted him, they showered him with abuse, till they compelled him to take back his shield and march on, and the other, remounting, led them on horseback as long as the footing held. But when the ground became too steep, he left his horse and pressed forward on foot, and so they found themselves on the summit, before the enemy. Number 5 there and then the barbarians turned and fled as best they might, and the Hellenes held the summit, while the troops with Tissaphernes and Arius turned aside and disappeared by another road. The main body with Chirisophus made its way down into the plain, and encamped in a village filled with good things of diverse sorts. Nor did this village stand alone. There were others, not a few in this plain of the Tigris, equally overflowing with plenty. It was now afternoon and all of a sudden the enemy came in sight on the plain and succeeded in cutting down some of the hellenes belonging to parties who were scattered over the flat land in quest of spoil indeed many herds of cattle had been caught whilst being conveyed across to the other side of the river and now tissaphernes and his troops made an attempt to burn the villages and some of the Hellenes were disposed to take the matter deeply to heart, being apprehensive that they might not know where to get provisions if the enemy burnt the villages. Carisophus and his men were returning from their sally of defence when Xenophon and his party descended, and the latter rode along the ranks as the rescuing party came up and greeted them thus, Do you not see, men of Hellas, they admit that the country is now ours? what they stipulated against our doing when they made the treaty, viz. that we were not to fire the king's country, they are now themselves doing, setting fire to it as if it were not their own. But we will be even with them. If they leave provisions for themselves anywhere, there also shall they see us marching. And turning to Chirisophus, he added, But it strikes me, we should sally forth against these incendiaries and protect our country. Carisophus retorted, That is not quite my view. I say let us do a little burning ourselves, 
and they will cease all the quicker. When they had got back to the villages, while the rest were busy about provisions, the generals and officers met, and here there was deep despondency, for on the one side were exceedingly high mountains, on the other a river of such depth that they failed to reach the bottom with their spears. In the midst of their perplexities, a Rhodian came up with a proposal as follows. I am ready, sirs, to carry you across, four thousand heavy infantry at a time, if you will furnish me with what I need, and give me a talent into the bargain for my pains. When asked, what shall you need? He replied, two thousand wineskins. I see there are plenty of sheep and goats and asses. They have only to be flayed and their skins inflated, and they will readily give us a passage. I shall want also the straps which you use for the baggage animals. With these I shall couple the skins to one another. Then I shall moor each skin by attaching stones and letting them down like anchors into the water. Then I shall carry them across, and when I have fastened the links at both ends, I shall place layers of wood on them and a coating of earth on the top of that. You will see in a minute that there is no danger of your drowning, for every skin will be able to support a couple of men without sinking, and the wood and earth will prevent your slipping off. The generals thought it a pretty invention enough, but its realisation impracticable, for on the other side were masses of cavalry posted and ready to bar the passage, who, to begin with, would not suffer the first detachment of crossers to carry out any item of the programme. Under these circumstances, the next day they turned right about face and began retracing their steps in the direction of Babylon, to the unburnt villages, having previously set fire to those they left, so that the enemy did not ride up to them, but stood and stared, all agape to see in what direction the Hellens would betake themselves, and what they were minded to do. Here again, while the rest of the soldiers were busy about provisions, the generals and officers met in council, and after collecting the prisoners together, submitted them to a cross-examination, touching the whole country round, the names, and so forth, of each district. The prisoners informed them that the region south, through which they had come, belonged to the district towards Babylon and Media. The road east led to Susa and Ecbatana, where the king is said to spend summer and spring. Crossing the river, the road west led to Lydia and Ionia, and the part through the mountains facing towards the great bear led, they said, to the Carduchians. They were a people, so said the prisoners, dwelling up on the hills, addicted to war, and not subject to the king so much so that once, when a royal army one hundred and twenty thousand strong had invaded them, not a man came back, owing to the intricacies of the country. Occasionally, however, they made truce or treaty with the satrap in the plain, and for the nonce there would be intercourse. They will come in and out amongst us, and we will go in and out amongst them, said the captives. After hearing these statements, the general seated apart those who claimed to have any special knowledge of the country in any direction. They put them to sit apart without making it clear which particular route they intended to take. Finally, the resolution to which they came was that they must force a passage through the hills into the territory of the Kurds, since, according to what their informants told them, when they had once passed these, they would find themselves in Armenia, the rich and large territory governed by Arontas, and from Armenia it would be easy to proceed in any direction whatever. Thereupon they offered sacrifice, so as to be ready to start on the march as soon as the right moment appeared to have arrived. Their chief fear was that the high pass over the mountains must be occupied in advance, and a general order was issued that after supper every one should get his kit together for starting, and repose, in readiness to follow as soon as the word of command was given. End of Book 3